The Lord be with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, God, our Heavenly Parent, and the Holy Spirit who empowers us this day, I welcome you to this service of worship. I want to begin by thanking all of those who are so instrumental in leading the church during my absence. I've always been amazed by the character of this congregation. It's, it's uh, congregants and it's staff persons. I do believe that I could disappear from the planet and it would take at least six weeks for people to figure out that I actually was missing. We have just wonderful people who have filled the pulpit, Paul Aiken and Anna and Elaine Cheats, folks who have made sure that worship and our classes and courses are online, our worship, I give a shout out today to Richard Van Reeden and Dr. Rebecca Blair, Leah Bergman and Melissa Mall with gratitude for all those who've been doing caring ministry, who've been leading our mission and doing our uh, other sorts of service in Christ Church, my deep gratitude. You gave me the opportunity to put together baby furniture for Will and for Yana, who is due in about three weeks. And I was so inspired by my um, relative uh, improvement in technical skill over the week that I actually came home and began several home projects that I had not completed in the last five to six years. Um, not with the great skill that my son DJ had exhibited, but nevertheless um, got several of those done. So I am just profoundly grateful for the time away and profoundly grateful as well for being back with you. This is Labor Day weekend and I ask that you prayerfully keep in mind those who continue to serve us in the midst of the pandemic. Keep in mind that many of these folks work for very low wages, that many of them are exposed to this virus that they are instrumental in keeping us alive. And so I would hope that we would be instrumental in providing for them through our politics and our economic policies because we owe them our lives. Please, on Labor Day and this weekend, please also thank them for their service to you. We remain in phase one. I wish I had other news to share with you. I am temporarily without my mask, but I will be uh, masking routinely, especially being back in Iowa. I was amazed being in Pennsylvania and the East, how many people were masked routinely. That is to say, everybody was. Uh, and to return to Iowa and see how many were not. And so uh, we have reached a sad status of number one in the nation uh, for lack of due diligence and the presence of the virus. We are in phase one as a congregation. This is not only a matter of necessity, but frankly of Christian witness and the stewardship of the lives of each other. Please, please be responsive. Our fall activities do begin, however, and many of those will be online, obviously. We ask you to check out the FPC Daily and to see what activities are starting up in terms of uh, Christian education and worship leadership and mission and other projects that we are in programs that we are taking up at this time. Let us now worship God. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Christ is here, calling us to the water, beckoning us to the feast. Christ is here, speaking to our souls, listening to our prayers. Christ is here, binding us as one body, sending us out in service. Christ is here. Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Christ is here. Let us worship God. Thank you. 
through Jesus, Christ Jesus, who came in into the world to save sinners. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins. God, you have told us what to do, but this love thing is hard. You've invited us to love you with everything we have. Instead, we have fallen in love with our jobs, our houses, and our electronic toys. Loving you intimately is scary and we often opt for another way. You're invited us to live in loving relationship with everyone we encounter, but there are folks who are downright hard to love. We confess our inability to love as we should. We need your forgiveness and help living out this love thing. Free us to love as you do. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please share that peace with those you find around you right now, and please feel free to share that peace on the news feed. Let us greet one another with peace in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Loving God, fountain of every blessing, open us to your life-giving word and fill us with your Holy Spirit, so that living water may flow through our hearts, a spring of hope for a thirsty world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first lesson today is from Romans 13, verses 8 to 14. Hear the word of God. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in revealing and drunkenness, 
not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Holy Wisdom, Holy Word. Thanks be to God. Isn't it wonderful to hear from our handbells and our brass? And again, a shout out to the folks who have served in the past and to our liturgists uh, also who are helping us with worship. Our gospel lesson today comes from Matthew chapter 18. It is beginning with the 15th verse. We hear uh, a scripture lesson about uh, Jesus' teachings and the early church's teachings about how to handle disagreements in the life of Christ's church. Here again, the word of God. Jesus said, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one back. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. 
If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and as a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. <clears throat> it has been years, years, since I have brought to someone's attention that their humor was inappropriate. Inappropriate because they were making fun of some category of person. And I was reflecting on that the other day. The fact of the matter is that there was a time when making fun of oh, rednecks, my own group, my own category, or making fun of Poles or African Americans or Kentuckians or whomever it might be was considered to be, well, fair game, but not anymore. And I think that is progress. But I did discover the other day, just reading along, that there is one category of person who still remains, uh, we, uh, we can still make fun of them. And that is debt collectors. We can find on bookshelves entire books of jokes about debt collectors, and they're all socially acceptable. For example, a debt collector is being honored by his peers at a great banquet. And right in the middle of the banquet, when the person being honored, the debt collector, was about to speak, the heavens opened up and there's a voice from heaven saying, I am so pleased with all your hard work. I will give you the choice of any one of three gifts. First, you can be the best looking person on the planet. Second, you can have all the wisdom of the world. Or third, you can be the wealthiest person imaginable. This speaker up in front of everybody decided the best choice would be wisdom. I want wisdom, Lord. And then the heavens closed, the light disappeared, and he was left standing at the podium. There's a dead silence in the room. And finally, somebody from the back yelled, well, we'll say something wise. And the debt collector reflected on it, and he said finally, I should have taken the money. Debt collectors may remain a target of humor, but we also know that humor has to do with anger. And we recognize that there is a great deal of anger in our current day toward debt collectors because there's a whole lot of debt going around. Indeed, we find that people are in trouble. Now, let me do say one good word about debt collectors. Some years ago, I was working with a young couple, both of whom were mentally and emotionally challenged. They had ordered a great number of magazines, realizing they were overwhelmed by debt for those magazines. They had begun calling the companies that had sent out those magazines that they had begun to order and would explain the situation. The person they talked to said, fine. And then what they would do is take a bill and put paid on it and put it into a shoebox. And they thought that solved it, but it didn't. Eventually, a debt collector came for them, and on the telephone one day with this collector, I explained the situation, explained how I was going to try to help, and explained that this was a couple who were in deep trouble anyway, 
and that this was predatory behavior to continue to call them. I worked out an agreement with this person, and here's what amazed me. About a month later, this gentleman called me back, and I thought, oh no, what now? But he said that he was having trouble sleeping. He had been worried about this young couple, and he just wanted to know how they were getting along. And it brings tears to my eyes now just to think about that, that bit of humanity in the midst of a culture where getting people to go into debt and then charging them exorbitant fees and leaving them in misery for a lifetime. In that kind of a culture, this bit of humanity appearing out of the fog. Debt is, well, generally speaking, a difficult challenge. 25% of Americans now say that they will die in debt. And that's a horrendous figure. Now, I do know we make the distinction between good debt and bad debt. If you go into debt for uh, an education that will pay large dollars at the end of that, that's considered good debt in, for some people. If you go into debt for a home and it allows you to have home ownership, that's considered good debt. If you buy a business that allows you to realize your passions and employs others and provides health insurance and disability for them, that's considered good debt. It fuels the economy. But bad debt is what so many people end up with through advertising and people needing or feeling like they need something that they really don't want to postpone. And so they buy it, they go and do credit, use credit for it, and then those credit rates go up and up and up. What, for a credit card, 15 18%. And they find themselves bound by debt. And to feel bound by debt, that automatically becomes bad debt. Did you know that is perfectly legal in many states, perhaps even on Iowa, that you can go to a payday lender and they can charge you, right? You give them your paycheck, they give you your money back. They can charge you 100% to 1,000%, 1,000% for those loans. Millennials, who are 24 to 39 years of age, have the average consumer debt of almost 80,000. Average consumer debt. On top of that is mortgage debt, average, $225,000. For Generation X, 40 to 55, consumer debt is about 136,000. This is the generation most bound by consumer debt and mortgages average about 288 200 excuse me $238,000 <clears throat> biblically speaking there is a mandate to make every effort as best we can to avoid debt because in those days there was no bifurcation between good debt and bad debt all debt was considered Problematic. Indeed, it was considered to be a form of slavery. We know well the story, and I've spoken with you about this before, but I think it's worth holding on to. We well know the story of the Hebrews being in Egyptian captivity, being enslaved there. And of course, Moses comes and liberates them and so forth and so on. What we need to understand is there's no archaeological evidence at all that these people were slaves as we would think of slaves in the Old South. Not at all. But there's every likelihood, because they came there during time of famine, right? The Hebrews gathered in Egypt, and then they were put to work. There's every chance that they were put into deep debt, that they, in exchange for food and for tools, were put into debt and then got paid something for their labor, but not enough to ever escape in debtitude. And that is the sort of slavery they endured. When Sherman marched to the sea and marched through plantations and freed the slaves, his plan was to take the plantations, break them up into one-acre plots, and redistribute to land. <gasps> Socialism! 
But Andrew Johnson, who became president, obviously, after uh, Abraham Lincoln's death, concluded that this was a terrible plan for Southerners. And so the plantation owners all had their lands restored to them. The black slaves, who were now free, had no means by which to live, and so they went to work, as they always did, back on those plantations. But this time, they had to buy their grain, buy their seed, and then they also had to buy their tools, and they had to buy their other staples from the landowner, from the company store, if you would, and they had to do so on the basis of debt. And so it was that for decades, decades, many former slaves died in such debt that they, functionally speaking, were still slaves. And that, my friends, is a problem of biblical proportions. Now, I've talked to you about it before. The Lord's Prayer, which is used so extensively to think about spirituality, and I do the same, and it's inappropriate, but nevertheless, it began as an economic plan for the realm of God, right? It began with the plan being, number one, a three-point plan, very simple, daily bread. Everybody gets their daily bread. Everybody gets enough to eat and enough to drink and enough to wear in exchange for a fair day of labor. And if you could not labor because you're sick or disabled, you still got your daily bread. Number two, debts were forgiven. Remember, the Roman Empire, in order to pay for its many, many exploits all over the world, leveraged debt against vassal states. And that was against the kings and the princes who were left behind. And they levered, leveraged uh, or leveled debt onto other people in subordinate positions. And you ended up with a farm crisis where farmers could not pay for their seed. And so the, the, what Jesus envisioned is for people to to be free of their debts. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And because if you became a debtor on your family land, suddenly you were trespassing on your own land, it was also forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's the second plan, part of the plan. And the third part is most interesting to me. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Do you know the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet, in rabbinic wisdom has always been considered the key to the other nine. Because when you covet something, you go into debt, or you steal, or you do something extraordinary, and that becomes a form of slavery. Covetousness skews all relationships. If you want to be delivered from evil, it begins with the heart. It begins with not being tempted, but being disciplined in not being covetous. This was the plan. In the midst of a significant depression during the time of Jesus, and so I'm in debt. I've got credit card debt. I've got home equity debt. Um, oh, I've got a mortgage. Finally got my education debts paid off. Um, and I try to avoid car loans, but frankly, I'm in debt. And it feels like some days up to my earlobes. Other people are in debt. Many struggle with debt. And yet I can say without any sort of hypocrisy whatsoever, and I say so confessionally, the ideal situation is for neither me nor you nor any of us to be in debt. Because it is a form of slavery. It fuels the economy. And much debt is good debt compared to other debt. But to be debt free would be a wonderful thing. Now, I've gone to all this detail about financial debt because it serves as the image. It serves as the analogy for understanding all of our other relationships. Because you and I are in debt in our relationships, especially the ones with which, in which we have made a covenant. When I married my spouse, I stood before my spouse, and I also stood before God, and I put myself in debt. I said that for 
better or for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, no matter what the circumstances, I would be there for my spouse. That in the covenant, I was turning myself over to that person and they were turning, she was turning herself over to me. And in this, we are in debt to each other. And that's lifelong. And that is, biblically speaking, truly good debt. When I bring children forward for baptism, I am putting myself in debt to God and to my children that I will forever attempt the best I can to nurture and to love them and specifically to form them with discipline into disciples of Jesus Christ. Now you ask my boys, and I haven't done a spectacular job all the time, thanks to their mother, they actually survived, but nevertheless, I did sign up to pay those debts be an American citizen, whether it is by birth or by choice, is to say that you will support the Constitution, the liberty and justice of this country. You're in a covenant. You have a debt. And of course, if you're accustomed to going into debt and going bankrupt and going into debt and going bankrupt and going into debt and going bankrupt. In order to escape your responsibilities, how hard it is to understand what it means to be a citizen and to honor the Constitution. Just saying. And when you join a church, now joining a church is an extraordinary thing. When you join a church, you are understanding that you are being part of a community whose very relationship within that community is a matter of indebtedness. It is a debt, the Apostle Paul says, of love. In this community, by us loving each other, we are a witness to the entire world of what love looks like, and that is justice, and that is mercy, and that is trust. We exemplify that in our body life so that all the world can see what God intends for the entire globe, for the entire universe. We are engaged, we're committed to a ministry of reconciliation. We promise God and each other that we are going to be in debt to each other in love. That is our witness. And yet we're humans, right? And as humans, we make mistakes. As, as humans, we sin. We offend others. Not that others just take offense at us, but we actually break a commandment. We actually fail in love. And that is considered to be the occurrence of bad debt in the church. We owe those that we have hurt. But by the very action of sinning and then being reconciled to each other, of talking it through, we witness to the world that the world itself was full of sinners who need to talk it through and to seek reconciliation with each other. This whole disciplining thing that we find in Matthew chapter 18, it's a mark of the church, John Calvin says. It is part and parcel of who we are, that we know that we sin and that we must apologize and seek for forgiveness and that forgiveness exercise because that is what the world needs. And we are in debt for that because of love. It makes perfect sense, does it not? And when he says, if people don't respond to that, put them out, right? Treat them as, as tax collectors, treat them as Gentiles. He's not talking about shunning. That's not what, what this is about. If you are in the world as a tax collector, a debt collector, in fact, in those ancient days, if you're in the world as a Gentile, right? You are the ones to whom the community is witnessing. You are the chief object of the purpose of the church to win people to the realm of God and to Jesus Christ, which means you must treat them as special people, as ones you want to bring back into the community. You are looking for their conversion. It's not shunning them. It is to love them in a special way because your debt to them is special. The love takes a different form. It may be tough love, but it's love nevertheless. And we are on the hook for love 
by being members of a church. So, to be in debt financially is normal. To be overwhelmed by it is hard, a form of slavery. We are to embrace the opportunity to escape it. To be in debt in love is a good thing. We are in debt by virtue of our covenants. Bad debt is when we sin against those we love. And reconciliation, which is part of our witness, is to recover from bad debt, to get back into good debt. Well, next week, strangely enough, we look at a text about a man who is in tremendous debt, who uh, is liberated from it, only to be cruel to somebody else who is in just a little debt. But that's next week's sermon. I haven't started working on it yet, and gosh only knows, I'll look at what other texts are, and maybe we don't have to talk about debt. So I'll see you then. God bless you. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess the faith of our baptism. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, uh, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Let us begin in silent prayer. Let us first give thanks to God who through Jesus Christ paid the debt for our sins and yet in covenant remains in a debt of love to us. Let us in silent prayer offer thanksgiving to God for God's love. Let us pray for those who feel enslaved by financial indebtedness, who dread the nights and the mornings because of their financial wounds and hurts. Let us pray that people will have their daily bread. Let us pray that those who are overwhelming debt will have debts forgiven and that they will forgive debts. We pray that for the conscience of people that will avoid putting other persons in too much debt. Let us pray for a world of social justice and let us work toward such a world so that people are free, free to love free for compassion, free from relationships distorted by money. Let us pray for people and for such a world, and that we be active in enacting such a world. Let us pray now for relationships in church and out of church. Let us pray that we enact reconciliation, that we, knowing that we are sinners, find ways to forgive and to ask for forgiveness. 
Let us pray that the debts of love get paid, that we not give up on each other or give up on ourselves. Let us pray for right relationships of justice and mercy and trust. Let us pray for all this. Now let us hear a prayer that I read this week called A Prayer in Brokenness. Not my prayer, but let us hear this prayer. O oh God, I cannot undo the past or make it never have happened. Neither can you. There are some things that are not possible even for you, but not many. I ask you humbly, and from the bottom of my heart, please, God, would you write straight with my crooked lines? Out of the serious mistakes of my life, will you make something beautiful for you? Teach me to live at peace with you, to make peace with others, and even with myself. Give me fresh vision. Let me experience your love so deeply that I am free to face the future with a steady eye, forgiven and strong in hope. Merciful God, we need hope now. We need hope as people labor in our midst who are underpaid and facing pandemic. We need hope in the face of the pandemic. We need hope in the face of terrible fires. We need hope in the face of wars and rumors of war. Bedlam and in international and national relationships. We need hope, Lord God. And we know that we need to be people of hope, to not obsess about the little weeds in our lives, but to look to the mountains of challenge in this world and to step up and to be the people, the beacons of hope the world so needs from us. All this we pray and much else that is in our hearts and minds in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. To those to whom much is given, much is being asked. Let us, in silent prayer, meditate on the gifts that God has given to us that now God calls us to share with the world. Let us offer our lives and all parts of it to the love and the justice and mercy of Almighty God. Let us give ourselves to God in our tithes and offerings and other mission support as the symbols of the greater gift of ourselves. Let us pray. Beloved one, these are difficult days in the midst of all that overwhelms. 
Keep us from doing harm where we intend to do good. You have shown us how to prioritize what is true, what is just, and what is compassionate. Bless our offerings and our intentions that we might faithfully apply your teachings in every aspect of our lives. Amen. Now go in peace and serve the Lord. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.